Rebecca Gould was back in her hometown of Melbourne, Arkansas, visiting family and friends. She and her sister lived together in Fayetteville while she was attending Northwest Arkansas Community College. But they both returned and Rebecca was staying at the home of her boyfriend, Casey McCullough. On the morning of September 20th, 2004, Rebecca dropped Casey off at work and then was seen at a convenience store buying coffee and a breakfast sandwich. From there, she had planned to go back to Casey's house, take a nap, and then pack for her trip back to Fayetteville. Except, when her sister expected to be picked up, Rebecca never arrived. This is Monsters. Rebecca Christian Gould was born on April 25, 1982, to Larry and Shirley Gould, one of four daughters. There are a number of different birth dates that have been published, but this is the date that is on Rebecca's grave, so I believe it's likely the most accurate. It seemed that Rebecca's parents went through a particularly nasty divorce, and there was a time when her father had tried to get custody of the girls. Despite the turmoil with her parents, Rebecca grew up as a small but protective sibling. Once Rebecca got older, she started attending community college and decided she wanted to go to the University of Arkansas. At that point, Rebecca and two of her sisters moved to Fayetteville and she started attending Northwest Arkansas Community College while she worked on getting into U of A. It's said that Rebecca and her younger sister Danielle were best friends and only a couple of weeks after moving, the two women made the trip back to Melbourne for a visit. Rebecca dropped Danielle off at her boyfriend's house before driving to Casey's house. Rebecca had been dating Casey McCullough on and off for about a year and he lived in a single wide trailer on his family's property. On Monday the 20th, Casey had to work a shift at the Sonic drive-in and Rebecca gave him a ride to work that morning. She planned to leave that day, so after work, Casey went out with some friends. Later in the day, when Rebecca never arrived to pick up Danielle, she initially thought that her sister had just changed her plans. But when Tuesday came around and she still hadn't heard from Rebecca, she got concerned and had her mother call the local sheriff for a welfare check. Deputy Charlie Melton got the call to locate Rebecca, and since he had been told that she had last been with Casey, his first stop was to the Sonic drive-in, where he was working another shift. He told the deputy that he ended up staying the night at his friend's house since he expected his house to be empty. Later, people would claim that seemed suspicious since Casey had a dog who he would have needed to take care of, and that stopping by his house on the way to his friend's house wouldn't have been out of the way. I couldn't find any confirmation of that claim, and it's possible that people are confused because Rebecca had her dog with her while she was visiting. Since Deputy Melton didn't get any answers from Casey, he then went to the young man's trailer where he found Rebecca's car outside. When he went inside, all of her belongings were still there, including the uneaten breakfast sandwich she had purchased the previous morning. Her purse, her keys, and even her Pomeranian dog Lady were still in the house. When he went into the bedroom, the sheets had been stripped from the mattress and some of them were found in the washer with blood. When the deputy flipped the mattress, he found blood on the other side. At that point, a full investigation was launched and Casey was a prime suspect. The only problem was that his alibi checked out. He was working the morning of the 20th and he was at his friend's house all night. When investigators did a more thorough search of Casey's house, they noticed that one leg was missing from a piano in his living room. People said that the piano leg was already loose and would regularly fall over when people walked by the piano. Though all of Rebecca's belongings were inside of the trailer, her suitcase wasn't. Investigators wondered if it had been used to transport Rebecca or some other evidence out of the house. Authorities searched extensively for the young woman but couldn't locate her. Some people thought she might have run off with her ex-boyfriend Justin, but when he was contacted he said he hadn't seen her. That story clearly didn't fit in with the bloody scene, but the family was grasping at any hope they could. On September 27, 2004, 
Rebecca's body was found at the bottom of an embankment off of Highway 9. The embankment was about 35 feet or 10 and a half meters down and she was propped up against the tree. She was in only a t-shirt and underwear. The medical examiner said that insect activity showed that she was likely killed seven days prior, which put her time of death on Monday, September 20th. Her cause of death was blood force trauma to the left side of her head. Her autopsy described two separate blows, the first that hit her face and broke her nose, and a second that fractured her skull. The wounds were consistent with the missing piano leg, but it wasn't proven to be the weapon. No defensive wounds were found, and there was no sign of sexual assault. She had also been strangled, and her hyoid bone was broken. Once Rebecca's body was found, Casey was put back under the spotlight. People said that Rebecca called him possessive, and that she wanted to break things off with him, and he wanted to be together. Some very common problems that couples go through before one of them resorts to violence. His co-workers, however, confirmed that he was at work from 8 a.m. until about 4.30 p.m., his friends then said that they picked him up from the Sonic after that. They drove Casey to pick up his truck, which his father had borrowed the day before. That was why he needed a ride that morning. They all went to the movies, and then they went back to the friend's house where Casey slept. Then, Casey went to work the following morning. The men had receipts and movie ticket stubs that matched their story. There were people who think that Rebecca could have been killed Sunday instead of Monday, but if that was the case, who gave Casey a ride to work Monday morning? That would mean a second person would have to have some knowledge they were keeping from investigators. Also, a cashier at the Possum Trot convenience store saw Rebecca come in Monday morning and buy a breakfast sandwich and a cappuccino. The same sandwich and cappuccino that was found in Casey's home during the welfare check. That, along with the time of death given by the medical examiner, it seemed unlikely to be the case. Investigators didn't stop at just Casey, though. They also questioned his family, since Casey lived on family property. His father had been out of town as a truck driver, and his brothers also had alibis. Casey had told a detective that on Sunday night, his cousin, a man named William Miller, who went by Billy, stopped by his house and the two talked in his driveway for a few minutes. Billy had been in town because he was helping his mother move from Arkansas back down to the Lone Star State. During the time Rebecca was still thought to be missing, Billy, his mother, and his brother had already gone back to Texas, so investigators had authorities in Texas go to his house and question them. He didn't have any information outside of confirming that he had talked to Casey in his driveway Sunday for a few minutes. Other suspects included a woman named Jennifer Turner, who had some sort of feud with Rebecca over her ex-boyfriend, Justin. Again, Jennifer had an alibi during the time frame that Rebecca was determined to have been murdered. Then there was a man named J.B. Yates, who had sold Rebecca some marijuana, and she had owed him $20. Authorities theorized that he might have killed Rebecca over that debt, but he claimed that she had paid him and that he wouldn't kill someone over $20. Then there was a man named Chris Cantrell who allegedly bragged to people that he had killed Rebecca. When he was interviewed, of course, he denied the claim and there was no evidence that he was actually involved. From there, the investigation into Rebecca's murder went cold. Years went by and other people started trying to solve the case. Rebecca's father, Larry, asked the police for files, but they refused. He then hired a private investigator, but they weren't able to get any further info into the case. When true crime blew up in the later 2010s, a number of podcasts were released that talked about Rebecca's murder. In 2018, a podcast called Hell and Gone premiered that was based on finding justice for Rebecca. The host was Catherine Townsend, who was from the area, and over the course of the podcast, she interviewed people close to the case and talked to Rebecca's family. In the podcast, a witness claimed that Casey McCullough had confessed to him that he had murdered Rebecca. That person said that he had been a co-worker of Casey's, and after getting drunk one night, he confessed to the killing. Investigators determined the witness not to be credible for a number of reasons. He had claimed the confession had happened eight years prior, but he had never told authorities. He only came out to tell the podcast? It seemed strange. Investigators also alleged that the witness's wife had had an affair with Casey and he was looking to retaliate. The witness denies that to this day. 
In 2020, Special Agent Mike McNeil of the Arkansas State Police was assigned to the case and he started the investigation all over again. He interviewed anyone who could have been involved, but every single person was cleared. The only other person that had been at Casey's trailer any time around Rebecca's death was Casey's cousin, Billy Miller. Since police in Texas had interviewed Billy in 2004, nobody had ever followed up with him. Since then, he had divorced his wife and moved to the Philippines where he married another woman and had two children with her. So I'd always joked that I'm going to marry, you know, somebody from a third world country, give them a bicycle and flip-flops and they appreciate me and all that stuff. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you guys have plans on coming back or are you going to set up shop? Uh, we have uh, about 30 acre farm yeah. that we have in the Philippines that the family kind of runs and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and mostly all the family, you know, we got pigs, goats, you know, banana plantation, coconut, yeah. cacao and stuff. So you think you're there for the for mm -hmm. the long haul or are you ever going to come back? I want to bring them back over here yeah. and stuff. Uh, the school education over there is crappy. Right. I got them going to a private school and stuff. Right. My son speaks uh, English, my daughter speaks uh, Messiah and a little bit of English and stuff. Yeah. Billy worked in the oil industry and he had a job where he taught nationals in Equatorial Guinea. That was a high paying job and as long as he stayed out of the U.S. for a certain amount of time each year, he didn't have to pay income taxes in the U.S. So Billy worked for a period of time in West Africa and then would spend most of his off time in the Philippines. But he was required to return to the U.S. every so often for a health checkup. Also, his mother and brother still lived in the U.S. and he would occasionally come back to visit them. Of course, with him being out of the country, it made it difficult for Agent McNeil to interview him. So it kind of turned into a waiting game. But Billy's presence in the case would not go unnoticed by anyone else. In 2019, some other podcasters had also started a Facebook group about the unsolved murder of Rebecca Gould and Billy joined the group. Nobody who was interested in the case knew anything about Billy Miller. Details from the official investigation were not released, so there wasn't any reason for Billy's name to come up anywhere. He was only in town for a few days around the murder and wasn't a well-known member of Casey's family. The first thing that stood out to the rest of the Facebook group was that this new member was from the Philippines and it was curious that he would be interested in a cold case from Arkansas. Of course, that could be shrugged off as someone just being interested in true crime, but when he started to make comments on the page, his behavior became more suspicious. He would point suspicion toward Casey's neighbors and comment about the specific area where Rebecca's body was found. One of the members had experience with genealogy, and she eventually discovered that Billy was in fact Casey McCullough's cousin. From there, they gave the information to the Arkansas State Police, but with Billy out of the country, there wasn't much they could do. Until he came back home. Agent McNeil had put an alert on William Miller's passport with U.S. Customs, and in October of 2020, he flew into Oregon to visit his family, who was living there at the time. When Agent McNeil called Billy's mother, she claimed that he hadn't been in the country since the year prior. Of course, authorities knew he was in the country. They had seen him. Not long after, Billy's mother called back and said Billy was coming to Oregon in November and scheduled a meeting on November 7th. Agent McNeil flew to Oregon and the interview began, and Billy was immediately accommodating. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. I don't have nothing to hide. Yeah. Though Billy was a prime suspect, the interview was conducted in a relaxed manner, giving the impression that Billy wasn't a suspect. Authorities made it seem like they just wanted to get as many answers as they could to help solve the case. Things started off light. They talked about his work. Billy explained that he worked seven sevens, which is seven 10 to 12 hour days on and then seven days off. He explained that his mother had moved from Texas up to Arkansas but didn't like it and wanted to move back. So he used one of his weeks off to drive up to Arkansas, rent a couple of trucks and then move his mother back down to Texas. He did have family in that area, but he wasn't close to his cousins, such as Casey. How many times had you been in that trailer, do you think? Uh, maybe, maybe two, three times. Maybe two or three times. Two or three times and stuff. So she was, Rebecca was killed in September of 04. When was the last time you were in that trailer, do you think? It was be way before that. Months? Yeah. Okay. And so, so I... Uh, well, 
Pamela, let's, let's, let's kind of explore that since you brought it up. Do you remember, why were you in the trailer and what did you do? Did you stay the night? Did you sleep? No, did you I, I was with there with Grandpa, I used the restroom okay. and all that stuff. And, you know, and because uh, I was helping Grandpa do some stuff. Right. So, more of messing with the cows and all that stuff because me, Grandpa would always say, you're the number one grandson. And I was like, why would you say that? Because you never ask for anything, boy. Right. I asked them a couple of us, they, how much are you going to pay me? And, right, right, right. You know, he would argue with me. He was like, you buy me a hamburger, that's a good deal, you know. And he's like, all right. Right. So, there was a couple of times that I've been in there. And then there was, you know, I'm just saying that we, we visited, went out on the back of the property. And then a couple of times where, you know, I'm just saying a couple of times. I'm saying two, three times. I'm not... Prior to 04, just a yeah. few times. Yeah. Now, at this point, Billy is claiming that he had been in the trailer a couple of times, but it had been at least months before the murders. He didn't say anything about being there Sunday the 19th, the day before Rebecca's murder, talking to Casey in the driveway. That detail continued to be omitted as he told Agent McNeil that he got to Arkansas late in the day that Sunday. He said it was just starting to get dark by the time he got there. Then, the following morning, he and his mother dropped his younger brother Jeremy off at school and then spent the day packing. The next day, Tuesday, they had picked up a couple of rental trucks and on the way back to his mother's house, they saw a bunch of cars headed out to Casey's trailer. They assumed he was having a party, so his grandfather went out to the trailer to check on it. When his grandfather came back, he told them that Rebecca was missing. They finished packing on Wednesday, got to Texas on Thursday, and he was questioned by Texas police on Friday. I thought that you guys found out about Rebecca after you already got back to Texas, but it, it's, you know, it's kind of odd that you were at the trailer on Sunday night talking to Casey out in the driveway and you guys are still up there when law enforcement starts looking for her and nobody talked to you guys in Arkansas. You know, that's kind of kind of unusual how that worked out. At that point, Agent McNeil brought up the fact that Billy had gone to Casey's trailer on Sunday. I mean, it was the reason they even looked into him in the first place, and I believe the only reason the police in Texas had been asked to question him. Agent McNeil reminded him that the report said that he told that officer in Texas that he had seen Casey as he was driving through town, so he turned around and followed him home. The two talked in his driveway for a few minutes, and Billy claimed that he had gotten the impression that Casey wanted him to leave since Rebecca was there. When Casey was interviewed back then, his statement matched that story. Billy claimed that he couldn't remember going to Casey's house that night and thought his exchange with Casey had happened during a different trip he had taken to Arkansas. The investigator was still trying to keep the interview light, and under the claim that he wanted to be able to eliminate him as a potential suspect, Agent McNeil asked if he could get a sample of Billy's DNA. Billy then told the agent that he hadn't spent much time in the trailer, but all of the furniture in there was given by his mother and he had been on that furniture a lot. Agent McNeil tried to explain that they would be using the DNA to match specific pieces of evidence and not entire pieces of furniture, but Billy never really consented. Instead, he agreed to take a polygraph. When someone takes a polygraph test, it's a long process. They don't just strap a person in and ask questions. The polygraphers do a pre-interview and then they do some sample questions to get a baseline and it takes some time. So what do you think, uh, Mike, why do you think they sent him here from Arkansas? What, what do they want to know? They want to know if you caused the death of Rebecca Gould. And th what would, how would you answer that question? How would I answer that? Yes. That, you know, how can you do something when you're in another location? Okay. Perfect. When you're at a U-Haul place or you're, you're with a whole bunch of people. Yeah. Okay. And all that stuff. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's the question that I think Mike, I'll have to talk to him, see if he wants to even ask you that question, right? Uh, I think he's going to tell me, hey, I think, you know, he wants to know, you know, are you the one responsible for uh, Rebecca's death, right? And so, if they were to ask you that on the exam, what would your answer be? No. Okay, no. perfect. And are you 110% 100, 100 positive? Yes. Perfect. You know, you're not going to have a problem passing the test if, 
you know, if you didn't do it, you didn't do it, and then it would just go through the, the process, and that's, that's, that's what they want to know, right? It's yeah. fairly simple, right? From the time Rebecca was killed, Billy had maintained that he was with other people the entire time. He was with his mother and brother, packing, picking up rental trucks, and he was never away from them. He had claimed that for 16 years. During the pre-interview, Billy explained multiple times that he was on blood pressure medication and he was afraid that that might affect the test. The polygrapher ensured him it wouldn't and he made it clear exactly what he meant when he asked him if he caused Rebecca's death. So, I think a good question to ask him is, is did you cause Rebecca Gould's death? No. Right? All right? And so, you see in the middle is a little box that says, cause Rebecca Gould's death, and then it says intentional or accidental. And I'm going to read these boxes to you, right? So, when I say, you know, if I ask you, did you cause Rebecca, did you cause that woman's death? I'm asking you uh, if you shot Rebecca causing her death, your answer would be no. Okay. And we'll go to the next box. It says you struck Rebecca with an object causing her death. What would your answer be? No. And then if I add, you caused Rebecca's death and the box is no. You, did you slam Rebecca against something causing her death? No. Okay. Uh, did you strangle Rebecca causing her death? No. Okay. Did you asphyxiate Rebecca causing her death? No. Did you drown Rebecca causing her death? No. Or you stabbed Rebecca causing no. her death? Or you shot Rebecca causing her death? No. Okay. So when I ask you, did you, did you, did you cause Rebecca's death? We're talking about all these things, right? And the answer is no. Perfect. How hard is that to answer that question? Not hard at all. Right? That's the test, right? That's that. There's just some other questions we're going to ask. We're going to go over those. That's what people, that's what so the is. How many questions there? No, just one question, right? So, when I ask you, did you cause her death, right, I'm talking about all those things. So when I ask you that, that's what that means, right? Did you cause her death, right? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. You're, you know, I've seen you, you're calm, you're cool, collected, you're not as, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not don't have that anxiety, the nervousness, right? Because we're talking, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm explaining to you all the little details. And better understanding and a lot of stuff. You're making it a lot easier and all stuff because I'm thinking the worst that, you know, I'm innocent and I come in here and take a lie detector test and hypothetically I fell. My thought, gel. Mm -hmm. It seemed that the polygrapher was able to reassure Billy enough and eventually they began. For some reason, the video of the interrogation turns from black and white to color. I didn't do anything to manipulate the color. This is how I got the footage. So from this point on, the footage is in brilliant technicolor. You probably won't be surprised to find out that Billy failed. So the results on the exam of deception indicated, right? So as to the questions of did you, you know, what do you that mean co by that? Cause you failed the test. I failed the test. Yes, yes. And so my heartbeat felt like it was just beating out of my chest. Yeah. And so what that tells me is that this is a couple things this tells me, right? It tells me that this has, doesn't tell me that you're a bad man. It just tells me, that, hey, when you answer that question, you're not telling the complete truth. It's all right. That's between me and you. And, you know, I've gotten to know you. And so we just need to know what happened, right? There's something that obviously happened. Which one of those boxes happened uh, to Rebecca? I don't know. Okay. You know, some things happen out there. Uh, we just want to, you know, want to just understand what happened. And, uh... You know, I just want you to be honest with me, right? And so, and you said yourself, right? You did something that, you know, you would own up to it, right? Yeah. You're a man of your word, right? Yep. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I don't know where you were at in your life that something happened, right? And then so, uh, I just want you to be honest with me, right? Because I, I trust you, right? All right? This doesn't tell me that you're a bad man, everything else. One, if you do one bad thing, doesn't mean you're an evil man, right? But, you know, people outside of this room, they want to know, are you sorry for what you did? And so, even like Rebecca's mom, she needs an answer, right? And yeah. so, and if something, like, something happened to your, your daughter or your sister or something like that. A child and all that stuff. A yeah. child or whatever. And you so would want to know, yes. You would want to know, and I know that you're a man of God, right? You go to church, you volunteer and stuff, and I know that you're a good man. Uh, one bad thing does not erase all the good things that you did and all people want. I don't know what happened in there, but hey, was it an accident? Something happened? Uh, I'm telling you, I do not know. Billy wanted to keep denying it, but you can tell that he knows the walls are closing in. 
The polygrapher explained that everyone else that had taken a polygraph had passed and he was now the only person who showed deception. At that point, Agent McNeil decided to try a different tactic. A more manipulative tactic. And it wouldn't be the first time he would try to use it. McNeil had interviewed Casey's younger brother, Corey, and pushed him hard because he didn't have an alibi for the time of the murder. That washcloth right there that was wadded up in a ball and shoved under the bed mm -hmm. next to the pillow that was shoved under the bed, that has your DNA on it. I seriously doubt that. It does. And I've already spoke with the prosecutor about it. Whenever it came back as a match, because I told you when I first met you, mm -hmm that we believe that we had the DNA from the killer at the crime scene, but we hadn't been able to match it to nobody yet. Mm -hmm. We've matched it up against Chris Cantrell, against J.B. Yates, against all them guys. No matches. I get your DNA. I don't believe you. If it's got mine, it's from a long time ago. It don't work like that, Corey. Okay, well, do what you gotta do. I'm innocent. And I knew nothing about this until I was told about it. I don't believe you. I'm not going to sit here and let you do this to me. Either let me go or arrest me. Corey wasn't rattled and even mentioned that he had passed the polygraph, but Agent McNeil didn't give up. He had one more trick up his sleeve. You know where your blue Ford Ranger is right now? No. It's at the Arkansas State Crime Lab. Cool. I'm glad you found it. I am too. Because, because, I whenever, you for it. because whenever you got in that truck, you were covered in blood. And I guarantee you, <laughs> we're going to find Rebecca's Dude, DNA in the cab of that truck. I know how this works, and I know what you're trying to do. I'm completely innocent, and you're looking at the wrong people. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to be a dick to you, but you're being an asshole to me. No. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm just telling you. I understand what we this have. is a serious ordeal. But I promise you, I didn't do this, and I didn't know anything about it. And if that's got my DNA on it, and you're trying to spook me into saying, oh yeah, it, it ain't. Of course, none of that was true. Corey's DNA wasn't on the cloth, and the agent didn't have Corey's truck. He was using a tactic where he told the suspect that they did have evidence to try to push that person to confess. Except Corey hadn't killed Rebecca, so he had nothing to confess, and he was eventually cleared. As Billy became the first person to fail the polygraph, Agent McNeil felt that was a good time to try the same tactic again. They didn't have Billy's DNA yet, so he had to word things a little differently. This is a washcloth that was under the bed that the killer used to clean up. It was watered up in a ball. Okay? We've, got, we've got the killer's DNA on that washcloth. Okay. okay? Would there be any reason for your DNA no, to be on that It shouldn't be on there. there. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be on there. That's right, it shouldn't be. Yeah. That truck looked familiar? Yeah. Yeah. That's your truck. Yep. Okay. Biological evidence, Billy, lasts for decades. Blood, skin cells, all kinds of stuff. Okay. All right. That was a really bloody crime scene. What you what happened? You got blood on the side of your shoe. We got Rebecca's DNA next to the gas pedal in your truck. No question about it. Her DNA's in your truck. So what you have to do is you have to explain to me how that's possible. If you didn't kill her, you know who did. And if you know who did, if you're covering for Casey, dude, I'm telling you, you have got to come forward right now with what you know. Because you cannot get around biological evidence in the floorboard of your truck. Okay? So tell me what happened, Billy. Tell me. I did not kill her. Who did?
Now, at that time, he really did have Billy's old truck. In the time that Agent McNeil was waiting for this meeting, he had been able to track down the Chevy S10 pickup truck that Billy had owned at the time of the murders. That way, he was able to bring pictures of the truck with him to make his ruse more believable. And it worked. Once Billy believed that Rebecca's blood was in his truck, his story changed completely. I don't know who the people are. All right. How were you involved in this thing? I, I am going to put myself on where I went uh, hunting on Grandpa's property. All right. And then when I was coming back out, I saw a white vehicle and a young blonde haired guy on the back porch. And it looked like he had gloves on. And uh, he jumped over the back porch. I jumped over, kind of walked into the house it to see what the hell was going on because Grandpa's place has been robbed. Uh, Grandpa, Uncle Bobby's place has been robbed, and I was thinking that it was being robbed. What did you see? What I saw was it looked like somebody was cleaning up. You went into the trailer. Yeah, I stepped into the trailer. What were these people doing? What did they say? They, they didn't. They took off, and then I sat there and kind of started running around, and then I thought it was the neighbors. Okay. All right. So, whenever you came in here, and you told us that Monday morning, you and your mom took Jeremy to school, that was a lie. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's the same. Okay. And, and the truth is that you got up early Monday morning to go hunting before mom and them got up. Before mom and them got up. Yep. So I went and went over there to go hunting and stuff and then to shoot a deer and, and that. And you're coming back out of the deer woods. Yeah. And I'm seeing a white vehicle and it looked like two guys. One looked blonde hair. Where was the one vehicle? Was, it was parked right in the back. Uh -huh. So right close to the uh, back porch. So William maintained that he had not been out to the house, that he had gotten up Monday morning and went with his mother to drop Jeremy off at school, then they were together all day. Now, suddenly, since he thought there was DNA evidence, he happened to have gone into the house right after Rebecca had been killed and saw some other people there. For no apparent reason, he kept that information secret when the police came and interviewed him in Texas and for the 16 years since. He just risked being a suspect by not telling authorities that he saw Rebecca's killer. That makes absolutely no sense, and McNeil knows that. He calls Billy's story bullshit. Billy knows he's been caught, so he asks if he can go out and talk to his mother, who arrived at the police station with him, and after that, he would tell the agent the truth. Initially, Billy just wants to say, I did it, and nothing else. He claimed he didn't want to talk about the murder, but Agent McNeil explained that they needed to confirm the details, so Billy relented and explained exactly what had happened. He said that he went out to the property early Monday morning to hunt deer and he eventually got the urge to kill. A, a human, not a deer. So he knocked on the door of the trailer and when Rebecca answered, he asked to use the phone. When he went to the phone, she went back into the bedroom and while he was pacing in the living room, building up his nerve, the loose piano leg fell over. He grabbed that piano leg, went into the bedroom and beat her with it. He said he hit her with it two times and then the leg broke. Then he used a necktie to strangle her. He had pulled his truck around the back of the house, put her body in the bed of the truck, and tried to clean the scene. He put some of the bloody bedding into her suitcase, but it didn't all fit, so he put the rest into the washing machine. The detail about her suitcase being missing from the trailer had never been released to the public. Then he flipped the mattress to hide the blood on it, but the question still remained. Why? Agent McNeil suggested that he was trying to sexually assault Rebecca, which he adamantly denied, a fact that was supported by the medical examiner, but it still didn't make sense. 
What was your not. intentions? Your intentions were to go in there and just kill her? Why? I mean, it was like a light switch that just went off and I just... I don't know, it just... Was like angry or, or just kind of... I don't know. Had but she, she made fun of you? No, was, she didn't. I just went in there and it was like... Bam, bam, bam. And that was it, and then I freaked out. If that's true, William Miller is the worst type of killer. He had no reason to kill anyone. He literally just had an overwhelming urge to kill, and he wasn't able to control it. Outside of self-defense, there's obviously no good reason to kill someone, but having a motive at least answers the question of why. There's a starting point for why the person was killed. Having someone walking around who gets the urge to kill for no reason is absolutely terrifying. After the murder, Billy drove through town right past the police station and dumped her body off of a ravine. Then he just continued on with his life like it never happened. He went back to his mother's house and said she never even knew that he had been gone. They picked up the moving trucks, packed up, and drove back to Texas. He lied to the police when they interviewed him about Rebecca's disappearance, but he didn't stop there. He went on to get divorced from his wife and got remarried, had two more kids, lied to them, and put them in a position that they could suddenly lose him if he got caught, which he did. Now, on top of leaving Rebecca's family without her, he left his wife without a husband and his kids without a father. Of course, one question that investigators had was why would Billy come in and agree to take a polygraph? Once he knew the police wanted to talk to him, he could have just returned to the Philippines. Some people would run, some people would like, you know, do all kinds of different things. You didn't. I'm trying to understand that, right? Because I'm so good of a liar, making everybody a fool, that I probably thought that I could make anybody oh. a fool. Yeah. I made you believe by just sitting yeah, there talking and all that stuff. I didn't believe you, right? Like I told you before, I would trust you. You give me a reason not to trust you, right? Did it when you, we had the interview and all that stuff? Did I give any persona of, of no, man, no, 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 right? I'm so good at I'm so good at lying that you believe me by just sitting there and just talking. Get the fuck out of here! That investigator absolutely did not believe you just sitting there. His job is to make you think he believes you so you feel more comfortable talking to him. And you fell for it, dumbass. Speaking of believing lies, by that point he still doesn't know that authorities have no DNA evidence. There was no DNA on a cloth from the crime scene and there was no DNA near the gas pedal of his truck. Those were lies and William immediately believed them and changed his story to justify why that DNA was in his truck. He goes on to talk about how he played his family for fools while he was caught because he was played for a fool. The absolute narcissism of people like this is astonishing. Unfortunately, the case doesn't end there. Detectives told Billy that they knew he had killed other people. It was a shot in the dark, but what were the chances that he had only killed one person? It was then that he confirmed that he had killed others and that his M.O. was to find a petite blonde female and to bludgeon or strangle them to death. He said that he was in his 20s when he killed his first woman and then asked for a map so he could point out where he had dumped the bodies. While waiting for the map, Billy kind of went back to normal as if he hadn't just admitted to murder. He asked for his cell phone so he could send out some messages to people. He sent them to his wife and his brother, and then he texted his work supervisor. I mean, dude, you just admitted to multiple murders. Your priority is to check in with work? When they finally got a map, Billy marked down multiple spots where he had allegedly committed previous murders. Does each red mark indicate that that's one victim? You need to just look. Okay, and you look here, 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 and here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, is that it? Yeah. Okay, so we have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six victims. Does that sound right? It yeah, looks like it, yeah. Okay, all right. All right, is that it? Yeah, okay. So I'll let it, if, if you want me to look at this. Can you? We can just go into towns. Okay. He claimed that he had six other victims. Four were sex workers and two were not. 
This number is unconfirmed, and later information from the FBI looking into the claims all say that there were five other victims. Billy claimed he did not have sex with any of the victims, he just picked sex workers because they were easy targets. He would pretend he was interested in hiring them, let them take off their clothes, then he would come up behind them and strangle them with a piece of their own clothing. From that point, William Miller was charged with the murder of Rebecca Gould. A search party was sent out to the area where Billy claimed to have disposed of the suitcase and it was found exactly where he said it was. Billy initially pleaded not guilty because there was some issue with him not having been read all of his Miranda rights out loud. While Agent McNeil was reading him his rights, he got distracted by a question Billy asked and didn't finish reading the last line of the Miranda rights. Ultimately, Billy had signed the form stating that he understood all of his rights, so the judge decided that his confession was admissible in court. Billy ended up pleading guilty and received a sentence of 40 years in prison. There has been no information about the other murders he claimed to have committed. He wouldn't tell investigators exact details of each murder and claimed that he didn't know any of the victims so he couldn't give them names. He just marked areas on a map and told them to go to those towns and look for an unsolved murder that fit his M.O. It seems a little fishy to me. I think it's possible that he's lying about the other murders so he can go to prison as a serial killer instead of a guy that murdered one young woman. We might never know the truth about his other possible crimes. There are also people who believe that Billy isn't the actual killer and still claim that Casey actually killed Rebecca. One theory is that Casey killed Rebecca on Sunday evening and Billy was there to help dispose of the body, but their reasoning doesn't make sense to me. It's very unlikely that Rebecca was killed Sunday since she was seen by the clerk of the Possum Trot. It's possible that the clerk was mistaken, but the breakfast sandwich and the cappuccino found in Casey's trailer backs up the idea that she had gone there that morning. People claim that it was unusual for Casey to stay the night with friends and think he was intentionally creating an alibi, but that's not proof of anything and Casey has passed multiple polygraphs. People have said that they don't think a young woman would let a stranger into the house and then go back to bed in her underwear. Billy said that she was wearing shorts when she answered the door, so she probably was already in bed in a t-shirt and underwear, threw on a pair of shorts to answer the door, and then took them back off in the bedroom. Whether or not that's something that Rebecca would do is not provable. Unfortunately, there are a lot of young adults that are too trusting, and since Billy had just been there the night before, it's very possible that she recognized that he was Casey's cousin and let her guard down. On top of that, Billy knew that Rebecca had been struck two times and he knew exactly where Rebecca's suitcase was. Which again, could mean he only helped after the murder, but why would he take the fall for a cousin that he wasn't overly close with? It doesn't make sense. Billy doesn't seem like the type of guy who would fall on somebody else's sword. Casey has gone on to make a statement, quote, First and foremost, my heart goes out to Rebecca and her family. I hope that they can now find peace and begin to heal. I'd also like to thank all the law enforcement involved who never gave up on Rebecca's case. If it were not for all of their hard work, true justice may never have been served. Last but not least, to my friends and family who stood by me and supported me during the online accusations and social media attacks. Thank you. You all helped me find peace in the middle of a storm. Knowing that Rebecca finally got the justice she deserved, I can now live my life in peace. Dr. Larry Gould said in interviews that he would like there to be a state or federal law that allowed family members access to case information after a certain period of time. He wanted to do more to try and bring his daughter's killer to justice, but he was never allowed any access to Rebecca's case files. William Miller will be eligible for parole in 2048 he'll be 72 years old. Of course, his parole eligibility will change if any of his claims of prior murders are confirmed. It is possible that William Miller snapped, killed Rebecca Gould, and never harmed anyone else, or it's possible that he's an even bigger monster. Only time will tell.
If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.